Welcome to the GPU hierarchy. It's another box. This is an unboxing of dun dun dun. Let's grab the pull tab. As you've seen, oh, that's no good. The whole thing's supposed to come off, not just part of it. That's better. If you've seen the 5090 videos, you probably can guess what this is. No, it's not a 5090, it's a 5080. Basically, it's the exact same box, right? Just with a 5080 card. And of course, this time it should be probably three eight pins. Yes. So a triple eight pin to 12 volt, two by six, connector 16 pin connector a little less power but where's your for your 5090 review people are wanting to know well so here's the thing i started testing got my numbers together and the net result was the 5090 needs a faster test bed so I had started on the 13900K. I'm gonna to have to switch to the 9800X 3D. And there's also some oddities here and there. I'm still testing a few things. I think I've got it sorted, but there's definitely a couple of games where I'm like, all right, I really shouldn't be bothering to test this right now because it's clearly buggy. And is that fair? Like maybe you should test buggy, buggy games. But the reality is drivers will fix these bugs and then what do you have you've got this hey i tested 5090 with bad drivers in the game where it was obviously not working properly at the time and performance was lower than expected i don't think that's useful so i will have that review up probably right before i put this up i don't know we'll see I'm not sure when I can show this video, but I'll unbox it. 5080. Now, the card itself looks virtually identical to the 5090. That's no surprise. And NVIDIA doesn't want to create a whole bunch of completely new designs. I think, I think the major difference, so it's still got the double flow through. You can see how there's, you can see right through the radiators to the other side. So the PCB is in the center here, the main PCB with the GPU and memory and everything. Then you've got a separate PCB for the PCI Express 5.0 portion connector. And there's another PCB over here for the IO ports, still triple display port 2.1B, UHBR20 capable, if you have a really high-end monitor, that's good. Venting on the top and bottom. Angled 16-pin connector. Nice-looking card overall. Did I mention? Yeah, there's these little, like, indents. There, that shows it. There's, like, these divots in the heat sink. I think that's to optimize airflow. I don't know how much it actually helps, but... So the key thing about the 5080 compared to the prior generation, it's a new architecture and it's definitely new. It's not just Ada Lovelace Redux. There are similarities, of course. Now, they're both built on TSMC's 4N process node. No change there, no die shrink really possible. Same core design, of the of the process node which means the only difference is going to be in either putting in more transistors or changing things and that's where it gets interesting die size for ad103 used in the rtx 4080 and 4080 super was 378.6 millimeters squared die size for the b203 used in the RTX 5080 is 378 millimeters squared. 
effectively no change in die size. They both have up to 84 streaming multiprocessors, SMs. So same number of potential CUDA cores and compute units and all that stuff. But with the 5080, you get all 84, which is 10,752, I believe, CUDA cores. Whereas on the 4080 Super, you had 80 SMs, so 10,240 CUDA cores. And on the vanilla 4080, there were 76 SMs, which was 9,728, I think. I might have one of those num some of those numbers slightly off, but close enough. Clock speeds, I think, are slightly higher on the 5080. And by slightly, I do mean slightly, like 50 megahertz. And NVIDIA's clock speeds are a little, like, they're conservative. So on the 40 series, they would say like, oh yeah, it clocks at up to 2.55 gigahertz on the 4080 Super. That was the official boost clock. In practice, it would actually run at closer to 2.75 gigahertz. So about 200 megahertz faster. That seems to be the case with Blackwell as well, that you'll get 200 to 300 megahertz higher in a lot of situations than the stated boost clock. So really it just comes down to, you've got a few extra SMs and architectural changes. And there are architectural changes. One of them is that this uses GDDR7 instead of GDDR6X. The 4080 Super had 23 gigabit per second GDDR6X. The, the 4080 had 22.4, 22.6, I think 22.4 gigabit per second memory. This has 30 gigabit per second memory. So that's a decent, like 30%, I think, increase in memory clocks, 30% more memory bandwidth. Still 16 gigabytes of memory though, that was disappointing to say the least. Price though is the same, $1,000, $999. A little bit of a disappointment still because fundamentally it's, it's the same chip size. So you're getting GDDR7, you're getting a new industrial design, dual slot instead of triple slot, but the cooler on this does seem to work well based on the 5090. And so on the 5080 where you have a 360 watt TGP instead of 575 watt, I don't think cooling is going to be a concern. Performance. What is the performance expectation? NVIDIA showed some numbers where a lot of them use DLSS4 with multi-frame generation. I'm not saying you can't use multi-frame generation but you can't compare MFG to fully rendered frames and say they're the same. They do not feel the same. They may look the same. Even if they do look the same, there's no new user input with frame generation on the generated frames. I've done some testing with the 5090 and with Cyberpunk, for example, using RT Overdrive maxed out settings full path tracing, you'd get like 30 frames per second at 4K, 31, I think. Turn on frame generation and it, at, at 2X frame gen, it almost doubled. I think it was like 57 frames per second. With 3X, it was like 87, something like that. 85, I can't remember the exact number. And then with 4X multi-frame gen, it was 110 frames per second. But if you looked at the divide by two, three or four frame rate to get what the actual input frame rate was, you went from 31 native to like 27 or 28 with frame gen one, and then down to like 26, with MFG3 and 25 with MFG4. Actually, it's 26 and a half with MFG4 because 110 divided by four. Is that right? Uh, 27 and a half. 
So it, it got a little more latency and a little bit lower input sampling with each level of multi-frame gen. So what did that mean for the experience? Well, 110 frames per second looked smooth and it was playable, but it felt laggy. It felt like maybe a game that was running at 35 to 40 frames per second. If you use DLSS upscaling instead, and you got your frame rate up to say 80 frames per second with balanced mode, I think that's what I got at 4K. The game looked about the same quality, like the DLSS transformers look really good. So what it came down to was input latency and it's much higher without frame gen, meaning much better. It was like 35 milliseconds compared to as high as I think 85 milliseconds with MFG 4X. So they're not equal. They don't feel the same. I would say playing at DLSS balanced mode, transformer mode with RT Overdrive in Cyberpunk felt way better than multi-frame gen, even though the frame rate was like 78 versus 110. But that's a real 70, 78 versus a every fourth frame being rendered 110. That's going to be the same with the 5080, the 5070 Ti, 5070, all through the Blackwell stack. The MFG numbers are not apples and apples. They're apples and pears and oranges. Again, it's not bad to have that feature but it's really heavy on marketing. And that's important to know. Should you get a 50 series instead of a 40 series? If the price is the same, yes, absolutely. The 50 series is better than the 40 series. It has more bandwidth. It has some forward looking features. It's got neural rendering acceleration. It's got FP4 support. AI is better, but if you're just looking at gaming performance, Without frame generation, the gap between the generations is not going to be that big. The 5090 is the biggest gap because it has 32 gigabytes of GDDR7. It has 33% more CUDA cores and streaming multiprocessors. It has 80% almost more memory bandwidth. Those are big increases. The 5080 compared to the, 50, the 4080 4080 Super, really, it's not as big of a jump at all. And the 4080 and 4080 Super are only like 3% apart. I suspect this will be more like 15 to 20% faster than a 4080 if you're not using multi-frame gen. If you're doing AI, in some cases that FP4 native support might make it twice as fast. If you don't care about AI, this is still the better card, but it's not going to be this night and day difference. Full review coming. We'll see how it performs in actuality. But multi-frame gen is super heavy on marketing. Don't, don't drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> it's fine that they've created this, but you have to know what you're getting. Like, would I prefer multi-frame gen at 110 frames per second over native at 31 absolutely it looks better and and despite the fact that input sampling is happening a little bit slower 27 and a half versus 31 that's on the 5090 um it, it felt better just this the fluidity makes it feel better but there are other ways to boost frame rates besides frame generation i think what we really need is frame generation that has user input, like their reflex to in painting and time warp sampling of user input and camera warping. Get that going with frame generation and frame projection. And we could be talking something that would feel a lot better. AI isn't going away anytime soon, people, but the hype is real and the user experience isn't always what it's cracked up to be. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. We will see you next time.